Well, thank you for joining us again at Gladstream's Online Bible School. Today we are in the study 39, and that's the prophet Zechariah. Now, we are privileged today because we're going to have an introduction to the book before we do our study. And this introduction to this book is going to be given by a uh, uh, the Reverend Dr. George Mitchell, and we're so pleased to have George. So over to you, George, and God bless you in your study today. Hello, everyone. It's good to be with you here. Uh, I grew a, a love for the Old Testament soon after I got converted. Uh, I had given up when I was a kid of five at Genesis chapter five, but I've gone beyond that from that time. And uh, it's good to talk about the prophets, you know. The prophets were special guys, raised up at a special time for special tasks. Uh, let me try and give you a word picture of what a prophet is. You know, the prophets are a special group within the Bible in the Old Testament. And they had terrific characteristics. The first one was they were a People of value. A prophet was a man of value uh, because the first description given of them in the Bible is man of God. He was a man of God. Um, he belonged to God. God was his owner. That was the thing. And it tells you in 1 Samuel 9 when Saul and his servant were looking for the lost asses of Kish. You've got to be careful how you say that. Um, they were, their father's asses were missing and they said their father's going to stop worrying about the asses and start worrying about us and the, the servant said well if we go down in that town there there's a man of God down there we can go and see him the, the prophets were known as special individuals who belonged to God God was their owner God was their lord and their master so it was you were first of all a man that belonged to God, a man of God, passive, possessive, owned by God. And the other thing, way of thinking about this title, the man of God, Ish Elohim, is that he was a godly man. It's adjectival, you want to grammatically. He was adjectival. He belonged to God. And folk could say to him, not only in the words you say, to you so clear, to me so dim. But that your presence brought a sense of him. And from your eyes he beckons me, and from your lips his love is shed, till I lose sight of you and see the Lord instead. He was a man of value. So these were a, a particular group of people. Secondly, they were men of vision. Men of vision. They were people who could see things. In fact, one of the descriptions often given in the Hebrew uh, text for the prophet is he's a seer. Somebody who sees something. The verb ra'a means to see and ro'e means a seer. A seer, a man who sees things. Two men looked through prison bars. One saw dust, the other saw stars. And these characters were people who had a vision of God. They didn't see the world like other folks saw it. If you were a guide in the ancient Israel in the 8th century, you have been wonderfully impressed by the, the architecture of the buildings. But Amos and these other prophets that we're going to talk about, they were people who, had, who saw things differently. They saw things from the perspective of God, people who saw things. They were men of value. They were men of vision, who shared God's perspective and things. Amos wasn't the slightest bit impressed by uh, the buildings. He was more interested in that the widows didn't get any justice and that the folk who went to buy wheat bought wheat plus dust and they paid through the nose for it. And they, they didn't care about things other than injustice in the life of the nation. So the, the prophets were men of 
value. And there were men of vision who shared God's perspective. Then there were men of vocation. There was a sense of these guys being particularly called from something to something. And the classic example is Amos. We'll talk about him in some detail later on. You know, they were folk who felt called by God. Amos was a herdsman. He looked after the bandy-legged ugly sheep called <coughs> the Nevi'im. And uh, he really was, uh, the prophet was a man who looked after these ugly sheep who were great yield, wool yielders, you would say. And uh, you got good <coughs> crop of wool from them. And he looked after them. And it says he, he also doubled up in his work. He wasn't only a shepherd, um, he was also a gatherer of a certain kind of fruit. And they discovered that the fruit that Amos gathered on the hillside was uh, the fruit <clears throat> that grew a thousand feet below where he looked after his sheep. Um, the Nokadim lived in a certain area of the mountain. Um, and there they looked after sheep and to eke out his living. I'm not quite sure what he worked at, but he was a he was a squeezer or a, a pincher or a scraper or a harvester. And <coughs> he says, But God took me from following the flock, and God sent me to speak to the nation of Israel. And so the man of vocation had a calling. We, we, we know the term call, we know, we know it in terms of weather force, forecast sometimes. At other times, we know it because of bingo. In the game of bingo, they usually have a caller, a man that calls out the numbers. Well, the prophets were callers, they were men who called to God from, they called to men from God, and that made them very important. Um, there were people who, who had a voice and a calling from God. And so uh, those who numbered the, the, the prophets um, found that God had called them to a particular ministry. Um, and God told me to do this, says Amos. And there were false prophets as well at the, t at the time. And the a great thing about the prophets is they're worth copying. So there are a lot of false prophets about, just as we have today, eh, false prophets. And they were in the, the action of coming apart and doing God's work. You know, there was a, a famous king in the 6th century. His name was eh, Cyrus the Persian. And Cyrus was the first enlightened ruler of the ancient Near East. John Bright says uh, he was a, a man who stood apart because instead of grinding his conquered enemies into the ground, um, Cyrus was kind to them. And when Cyrus of Persia, the upstart from Anshan, Anshan they called him, when the, uh, Cyrus came to the throne, he decided to try and win the goodwill of his subject peoples. And that's what he did with Israel. It was unheard of in 530 BC that he issued an edict eh, eh, that they, the Israelites could stop being Babylonian captives any, anymore and working on the Babylonian canals and working on the Babylonian fields and living in their prisoner of war camp eh, in Babylon. And they were, they were set free. About 50,000 of them were given a grant by Cyrus to return home and to take with them the, the precious vessels of the temple. Unheard of! Gave them money grants to settle and resettle in Israel. In Israel. And it was a wonderful call eh, after these years of bondage in Babylon. Um, after 18 years uh, in 50, 520 BC, um, Haggai wrote his prophecy 
in the time of the second year of Darius the first of Persia. And Haggai and Zechariah both uh, combined uh, in their oracles to have them written down and provided for us. And, and today we want to have a look at uh, one prophet in particular, the one called Haggai. Uh, and Haggai was a man encouraged by Zechariah. Zechariah was a a man who had a message of encouragement for the people. It was uh, uh, there are twenty seven Zechariahs mentioned in the Old Testament. Um, his father was a priest, Berechiah, who probably died when Zechariah was young. So Zechariah was an, an incredible, immediate successor of his grandfather Edo. You read about him in Nehemiah chapter 12. Edo was a priest who returned from Babylon with Zerubbabel and Joshua, who was repeatedly a member um, of the great synagogue, the precursor to the Sanhedrin in the New Testament time. The Jews had a wonderful saying, Yamim Ba'im. And Yamim Ba'im means days are coming. The Jews were always looking in hope ahead and messianic prophecies, prophecy about the Messiah who was coming and also about the Messiah coming again. And both uh, Haggai, Zechariah and also uh, Hosea and Amos have a hope ahead of them and uh, it puts a spring in their step. Yamim Bayim. Days are coming. In the case of Zechariah, there's so much in his prophecy that spans such a vast amount of years, including a book of consolation and hope, a call to repentance, a vision of horses and riders and surveyors and golden lampstands and flying scrolls and chariots. It's an amazing book in the various uh, chapters of Zechariah. Uh, it's actually, I think, 14 chapters altogether. And uh, the Lord's care for Jerusalem is underlined in these visions that he has, visions that God cares for Jerusalem, that God will look after them in the future, that the, the future will be a future of cleansing, when they, they turn from their wicked ways and they use the word shuv, which means to turn, to, re to repent of their sin and change their ways. And uh, Zechariah is hope, hopeful that this will happen in his time, but away beyond it, um, God will make the Jews return to Palestine, lay the foundation of the temple, send Messiah, and send Messiah again in a return later on in the second coming of the Messiah. And so as we're unlocking these minor prophets, as they're called, they're not minor in the sense of importance, they're minor in the sense of the length of their articles. In the prophets, the big three, Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, are all long, long accounts in the visions that are there. Um, and it's not that they're unimportant, these minor prophets, but uh, we've had a chance to look at them uh, as we move on to our study. The Book of the Prophet Zechariah the book is set after the return of the exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem, and we're told in the book of Ezra that Zechariah and Haggai together challenged and motivated the people to rebuild the temple and look for the fulfillment of God's promises. Now long ago, Jeremiah the prophet had said that Israel's exile would last for 70 years, and that afterwards God would restore his presence to a new temple and bring his kingdom and the rule of the Messiah over all nations. The dates at the beginning of this book tell us that those 70 years are almost up. But life back in the land was hard and it seemed like none of these promises were going to come true. Why? And the book of Zechariah offers an explanation. 
It has a fairly clear design. There's an introduction which sets the tone for a large collection of Zechariah's dream visions, and that's concluded by chapters 7 and 8. And then this is followed by two more large collections of poetry and prophecy. Let's just dive in and see how the book works. It begins with Zechariah's challenge to his generation to turn back to God and not be like their ancestors who rebelled and refused to listen to the earlier prophets, which landed them in exile. And so now the returned exiles respond positively to Zechariah. They repent and humble themselves before God, or so it seems. The next large section is a collection of eight nighttime visions that Zechariah experienced. And just to prepare you, these are full of very bizarre, strange images, a lot like your dreams. The idea that God communicates to people through symbolic dreams, it's very old. It goes back to the book of Genesis. The dreams of Jacob or Joseph or Pharaoh, these gave meaning to current events at the time, but they also gave a window into the future. And so Zechariah has his own dreams now, and they've been arranged in this really cool symmetric design. The first and the last visions are about four horsemen each. They're like rangers patrolling the world on God's behalf, and it's a representation of God's attentive watch over the nations. Their report is that the world is at peace. And in Zechariah's day, this refers to how God raised up Persia to conquer Babylon and bring peace. And so the question now arises, the 70 years of Israel's exile are almost up, is now the time for the messianic kingdom in Jerusalem? And God responds by saying that he's determined to fulfill those promises, but he leaves the question of timing unanswered. The second and seventh visions are paired because they're both reflections on Israel's past sin that led up to the exile. So the second vision is about these horns that symbolize the nations that attacked and then scattered Israel, Assyria and Babylon. But then these horns or empires are themselves scattered by a group of blacksmiths, an image for Persia. The seventh dream is about a woman in a basket, and we're told that she's a symbol of the centuries of Israel's covenant rebellion. And then this woman is carried off to Babylon by other women who carry the basket flying with stork wings. This is so strange. The third and sixth visions are paired as they're both about the rebuilding of a new Jerusalem. So a man is measuring the city. It's an image of God's promise that Jerusalem will be rebuilt and become a beacon to the nations who will join God's people in worship. And then the sixth dream is about a scroll that flies around the new Jerusalem punishing thieves and liars. The idea being that the new Jerusalem is a place that's purified from sin by the scriptures. The fourth and fifth visions are at the center of this collection, and they're about the two key leaders among the returned exiles. So Joshua, the high priest, and then Zerubbabel, the royal descendant of David. So Joshua had been symbolically wearing Israel's sin in the form of these dirty clothes, but then those are taken off and he's given new clothes and a new turban, a symbol of God's grace and forgiveness. And then an angel tells Joshua that if he remains faithful to God, he will lead his people and Joshua will become a symbol of the future messianic king. The other vision is about two olive trees that supply oil to this elaborate gold lamp, which itself is a symbol of God's watchful eye over his people. And these two trees symbolize the two anointed leaders, Joshua and then Zerubbabel, who's leading the temple rebuilding efforts. And God says that success will not come to this new temple if it's the result only of political maneuvering. Rather, these two leaders must be dependent upon the work of God's spirit. The visions come to a close with a bonus vision from the prophet, and it picks up the themes of the central fourth and fifth visions. It's Joshua, the high priest again, and he's given a crown and presented as a symbol of the future Messiah who will also be a priest over God's kingdom. And then Zechariah closes it all out saying that all of these visions will be fulfilled only if the current generation is faithful to God and obeys the terms of the covenant. And so altogether, these three visions emphasize how the coming of the messianic kingdom is conditional upon this generation being faithful to God, which leads to the conclusion of the dreams. It's another challenge from Zechariah, and a group of Israelites come, and they've been mourning over the former temple's destruction for nearly 70 years. And they ask him, is it time to stop grieving? I mean, is God's kingdom going to come very soon? And Zechariah again reminds them of how their ancestors rejected God's call through the prophets, which led to the exile. And so he challenges them too. He says, this generation will see the messianic kingdom only if they pursue justice and peace and remain faithful to the covenant. 
So in other words, Zechariah reverses their question. He asks, are you going to become the kind of people who are ready to receive and participate in God's coming kingdom? And that question is left just hanging there. The people don't answer and the book just moves on. And so we come to the final sections that are very different from chapters 1 to 8. Each section is a kaleidoscopic collage of poems and images about the future messianic kingdom. So the first one, chapters 9 to 11, describe the coming of the humble messianic king who's riding a donkey into the new Jerusalem to establish God's kingdom over the nations. But then, all of a sudden, this king, he's symbolized as a shepherd over the flock of Israel, and then he's rejected, first by his own people, but then also by their leaders who are also symbolized as shepherds. And so God hands Israel over to these corrupt shepherds. And it raises the question, will Israel's rejection of their king last forever? In the final section, chapters 12 to 14, say no. It's another mosaic of poems and images about the future messianic kingdom. And they depict the new Jerusalem as a place where God's justice will finally confront and defeat evil among the nations. It's very similar to the same themes in prophet Joel or Ezekiel. But then God also will confront the rebellion within the hearts of his own people. He's going to pour out his spirit on them, he says, so that they can repent and grieve over the fact that they have rebelled and rejected their messianic shepherd. The final chapter concludes with the new Jerusalem as the gathering point for all of the nations. And then this city becomes a new Garden of Eden and there's a river of living water flowing out of the temple bringing healing to all of creation. And that's how the book ends. And so Zechariah just leaves you to ponder the connection between chapters 1 through 8 and 9 to 14. And the point seems to be that this future messianic kingdom of the book's second half will only come when God's people are faithful to the covenant, the point of the first half. Reading the book of Zechariah is a wild ride. These visions and poems are full of startling imagery and they do not follow a linear flow of thought. And that's part of the point. It's like history and our lives. It doesn't always fit into neat orderly patterns. But the prophets offer us glimpses of God's hand at work, guiding history towards his own purposes. And so ultimately, Zechariah invites us to look above the chaos and hope for the coming of God's kingdom, which should motivate faithfulness in the present. And that's what the book of Zechariah is all about. I'm going to begin our study of Zechariah by reading a few verses from chapter 8. You may be surprised at this. The Lord of Heaven's armies says, get on with the job and finish it. You've been listening long enough. For since you began laying the foundation of the temple, the prophets have been telling you about the blessings that await you when it's finished. Before the work began, there were no jobs, no wages, no security. If you left the city, there was no assurance you would ever return for crime was rampant. But it is all so different now, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, for I am sowing peace and prosperity among you. Your crops will prosper, the grapevines will be weighted down with fruit, the ground will be fertile with plenty of rain, and all these blessings will be given to the people left in the land. May you be as poor as Judah, the heathen used to say to those they cursed, but no longer. For now Judah is a word of blessing, not a curse. May you be as prosperous and happy as Judah is, they'll say. So don't get afraid or discouraged. Get on with rebuilding the temple. Now I read that because that could have been Haggai speaking. That's exactly the message of Haggai. And Haggai and Zechariah overlapped <coughs> by one month. And uh, Zechariah began exactly where Haggai left off. And uh, so that's why I read it. Now, if Haggai is one of the easiest of the minor prophets to understand, then Zechariah is absolutely the hardest. If you've read it through before this uh, talk, you, well, I hope you could teach me a bit about it. But it really is a very confusing and puzzling book. There are many differences between Haggai and Zechariah in spite of the similarity I've pointed out. There are three in fact. One, Zechariah was later than Haggai. Not much. They did overlap by a month, but then Zechariah went on much longer. It was like a relay race. 
as if Haggai passed the token on to Zechariah who then ran with it, but he ran very much further. So secondly, it is much longer than Haggai. Twelve chapters and uh, eleven pages instead of just a couple. And thirdly, he did go on at least for two years and uh, that gave him much more revelation to share. But the biggest difference is that Zechariah looked into the far distant future. Haggai dealt with the present and the immediate problems and the immediate future. But Haggai seemed to be able to look far forward right to the end of time altogether. And uh, some of his more immediate future predictions are all bundled up with some of his very distant future predictions and that leaves us in confusion. Which time is he talking about? And we'll have to try and sort that out a bit. There is more poetry in Zechariah than Haggai, just a bit more, as we'll see. But above all, this is what we call an apocalyptic book. That's still prophecy, but it's a particular kind of prophecy that's different from the other kind. It's a, a prophecy that is more in pictures than in words, more in visions than in verbal form, more for the eye than the ear. And so apocalyptic prophecies are full of symbols, weird pictures, animals play quite a large part in apocalyptic prophecy. And above all, angels come into the picture in apocalyptic prophecy. They don't normally. And there are angels who show people the pictures and then explain the pictures to them. Now what does all this remind you of? The book of Revelation. It also reminds you of the second half of the book of Daniel, which is also apocalyptic, and a few parts of the prophet Ezekiel. Do you remember Ezekiel saw great big wheels with eyes all round the rim and wheels within wheels like a sort of gyroscope uh, rushing here and there around the sky? That's all what we call apocalyptic prophecy. The reason why it comes in this strange form is very simple. It's very difficult to imagine the distant future. You can imagine the near future quite easily because that's just simply the present trends being worked out. But, you know, how would you describe life today to somebody living a thousand years ago? How would you describe television to them? They would have little or no understanding. The only way you can describe the distant future to people is to try and give it in the form of a picture or a symbol and then explain the symbol to them. So we're dealing in Zechariah with a very different kind of prophecy. So we have horses of different colours plus riders, we have horns and blacksmiths, we have stones with seven eyes on each stone, we have measuring lines and olive trees and candlesticks, women in baskets and women's with, women with stalks wings and flying scrolls. Now all this kind of thing is so strange and uh, rather difficult for us. We're down-to-earth matter-of-fact people and we understand people who call a spade a spade. We understand Haggai very easily. He says, get on with the job, finish the temple and God will bless you. Well now, who needs any explanation of that? But Zechariah is a different kettle of fish. So, let's look first at the prophet. His name means God remembers. And that's quite significant. God remembers. But it's a very common name in the Old Testament. I've counted 29 people called Zechariah in the Old Testament. Very common name. He was a priest and that also is very significant. Here we've got a priest who is also a prophet. Now I told you that two out of fifteen people coming back from Babylon were priests. It was a religious return. They, the people came back purely to re-establish God's name in Jerusalem. They certainly didn't come back because the land was going to be more fertile or because trading would be better. They came back for spiritual reasons and so a high number of priests returned. And there are two extraordinary developments now which Zechariah highlights. The first development is that now priests are going to replace prophets. For the next 400 years there are going to be no prophets just priests. And Zechariah being a priest and a prophet marks a kind of transition. 
And he predicts that there will come a day when nobody will claim to be a prophet. They'll say, I'm not a prophet, don't call me a prophet. And the priest is replacing the prophet. The second startling development is that the priests are going to take over from the kings as leaders. And one of the things that Zechariah will do as an acted symbol is to make a crown of silver and gold and put it on the head, not of Zerubbabel, who is the prince of the royal line of David, but on Joshua the priest. Now that is an extraordinary development. And for the first time in Israel's history, the office of priest and king will be united. That has only happened once before in the Old Testament, way back in the book of Genesis, a man called Melchizedek, who was the king of Jerusalem before the Jews got it, and who was a priest as well as a king, and who we know from the New Testament is the line from which Jesus comes. He is of the order of Melchizedek, not of Levi. He is a priest and a king and a prophet, of course. So Zechariah marks a kind of fusing of these three offices, these three positions of leadership. So the priest is taking over from the prophet and the priest is taking over from the king. And by the time Jesus came, there were only priests. John the Baptist was the first prophet they would get after 400 years. But the leaders, the rulers, were two high priests, Annas and Caiaphas. So Zechariah is a very significant book in marking this transition. If you remember over 2,000 years of Israel's history from Abraham to Jesus, you can divide the 2,000 very neatly into four quarters of 500. During the first 500 from 2,000 to 1,500, they were led by patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph. During the next 500 years, from 1500 to 1000, they were led by prophets from Moses to Samuel. From 1000 to 500 BC, they were led by kings or princes. But from 500 to nothing, they were led by priests. And so God had given them a sample of every kind of leadership, and I'm afraid every kind of leadership failed Israel. What they needed was one leader who would combine all these officers in one. And that's what they would get with Jesus. But can you see how the Old Testament prepares the people for the right leader? By showing them first patriarchs, fatherly figures, then prophets, men who spoke from God, then princes who reigned on a throne, and then priests who interceded for them before God. Well now, let's look at the outline of Zechariah. It very neatly divides into two halves. Uh, we're going to look in great detail at these two halves, the first half in this talk and the second half in the next talk. And uh, the first half is pretty well like Haggai, except that he uses this apocalyptic way of giving his message because that's how he received it from God. He received it in pictures, so he passes it on. But the whole of chapters 1 to 8 are concerned with the situation as it is now. And that's why, like Haggai, he dated his prophecies. The first one he forgot to put the day in, but he did give us the month and the year. And then the next was uh, three months later. And the next was two years later. But just like Haggai, he dates his prophecy and they fit exactly into the situation on that date. So he's just carrying on the work of Haggai. I don't know why Haggai stopped prophesying or why God sent someone else to carry on. Maybe Haggai died or well, was taken ill and couldn't continue, but Zechariah took over just a month before Haggai finished and simply carried on. So we have it very clearly divided. And the first half divides very clearly again into three separate times of prophesying, each dated, so we can look at each as a unit, as a sermon that he preached to the people of God. Remember, they're still building the temple. It's not finished yet, but they have listened to Haggai. The one striking thing about the prophets who came after the exile is that the people listened to them. 
and did what they told them. Well, if you'd been 70 years away from home and you got home, you'd pay much more attention to prophets then, wouldn't you? And indeed, Zechariah begins a month before Haggai ended with quite a pointed sermon. All he did was remind them of the past and he reminded them about their predecessors, their forefathers in the same land. And he said it was precisely because your forefathers wouldn't listen to the prophets that the exile happened. A very timely reminder. We don't need to say too much about this. He just rebukes them and says, now you be jolly careful to listen to the prophets because your fathers didn't and they erred and went wrong and God had given them many prophets to tell them what to do and they wouldn't listen and that's why they went into exile. So you better listen now to what we tell you. That's the summary of his sermon as you read it through. Very simple sermon. What he's saying is, your forefathers not only knew they were doing wrong, but they were told they were doing wrong. They had no excuse whatever. Don't make the same mistake. He's almost telling them, now you do what Haggai has told you or you'll be in trouble too. Then he stopped preaching for three months or yes, nearly three months. And then he started again and this time a very unusual sort of approach. He gave them eight pictures which had all come to him in the night but not as dreams. They'd come as visions. The difference between a vision and a dream is you're awake when you see a vision, you're asleep when you dream a dream. I'm much happier receiving visions than dreams because it says your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. <laughs> so I want to stay in the vision fa phase as long as possible. But a vision is a kind of picture that comes to your mind that has a message in it. And more and more people today are experiencing visions, though they do need testing. You get all kinds of weird ones like seeing jellyfish with daggers through them and you know, the kind of thing, and you wonder what they are. I was in one place where somebody got up after I'd spoken for an hour. I preached for an hour and the vicar said, has anybody got a word from the Lord? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't tell you where it happened because you'd know the church and you'd know the vicar, but uh, a man got up, he said, I see a lot of bicycles and they, they, none of them have got chains on connecting the pedals to the wheels. And he said, I don't know what it means. And the dear vicar said, has anybody got the, tr the interpretation? And nobody had. <laughs> and it went on from there. After you've preached your heart out for an hour and somebody says, has anybody got a word from the Lord? You, re you really do wonder. But we do need such pictures. And such pictures, if they're from God, have a real thrust in them. And visions come during the day uh, when we're awake. But these came through the night and it says God had to keep waking him up to give him the next one. Isn't that interesting? He kept dropping off to sleep. Wake up, wake up, I've got another vision for you. So God was not bothering with dreams. Maybe Zechariah was young enough to have visions. Well now the eight visions or pictures seem quite unconnected with each other, but when you look at them carefully, they are addressed, let me get my pointer out again, they are addressed to the situation of the rebuilding of the temple, the first two, then the rebuilding of the city, then the next two concentrate on the two leaders, Joshua and Zerubbabel, and the last three concentrate on the condition of the people, so that the pictures are terribly relevant. And if at first sight they seem a bit obscure, uh, when you pray them through and look at them carefully, they were very relevant pictures to what was going on right then, to the present problems of the people. And then finally, uh, this time he finished sharing these eight pictures by saying, now we're going to have a coronation. And they had this uh, action, a symbolic action, in which the priest, Joshua, was crowned king instead of Zerubbabel, the prince of the royal line of David. And that was his second sermon. All right, let's just go through these cryptic pictures. But if you underline your Bible, I want you to underline the refrain that keeps coming all the way through. We'll find it in the second half of Zechariah 2. The refrain is, then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Then you will know 
that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. And what he's saying is this, the test of a prophet is whether what he says happens. Whether what he forecasts and predicts comes true. And in fact, there is one of the laws of Moses that if a prophet says something's going to happen and it doesn't, you stone that prophet, he's false. That should make anybody hesitate before they make a prediction about the future. Fortunately, we're not under the law of Moses, but we do have false prophets around. And it's very important that they are tested and that when they say this is going to happen and it doesn't, then they should be rebuked. So he says, I'm predicting certain things here and when they happen, then you will know that the Lord Almighty sent me to you. All right? So let's go through the pictures. The first one is a four horsemen among myrtle trees. Two red horses, one brown or bay and one white, with riders on them. They are God's press reporters. That's the explanation the angel gives. These are messengers of God who ride through the earth and report back to God and tell him what's happening. So we see them as reporters. Uh, if it had been a vision today, they'd have been on motorbikes, but of course they're on horses because that's the day when they got around on horses. And so these are God's reporters reporting back to God. And they are all reporting there is peace in the whole earth. And that was precisely the situation. Because Cyrus had defeated Babylon and Cyrus was a man of peace, the whole earth was at peace. There were no wars anywhere. And what uh, Zechariah is really saying is take this opportunity when you won't find yourselves fighting battles out there to get this whole city rebuilt, to get the temple completed. Don't settle back, but use this window of opportunity to get the job done before you find yourselves having to send soldiers out and fight another war or find yourselves invaded by someone else. I'm afraid not very long after they were invaded by others, by Egyptians, by Syrians, by Greeks and Romans. But there's a window of peace here when they could get on and rebuild. And really it's saying God has given this window of peace, this short time of peace, so that they're not distracted from the job that's in hand. That's the meaning of the first little picture. I can't go through every detail in the picture, but uh, he also adds that he is angry with those who uh, took them away and with those who've treated them badly. And he's going to deal with them, but not yet. There's going to be this time of peace when God doesn't send war to any nation. Second, four horns and blacksmiths. Now, I understand this. Uh, Zechariah must have been a farmer of some kind. There are many agricultural pictures here. And I used to dehorn, there's a big spider. There, I used to dehorn uh, Ayrshire bulls. I don't know if you know Ayrshire cows. They're usually brown and white and they have horns like that. Very spectacular. But uh, they were very dangerous. I still have a mark behind my ear where one of them caught me. And I looked after about 15 bulls, Ayrshire bulls. And I tell you, you treat them with respect. <laughs> I even had to put rings in their noses. That's quite an experience. But you've got to get that in or you'll never be able to control them later. But because those horns were so dangerous, they could smash fences with them, they could certainly deal with you. The practice of dehorning cattle came in. And when they were quite young, we had to take the horns off them. We actually burnt them off or filed them off, cut them off various ways. And you need strong instruments to do it. That's the picture he sees here. He sees four blacksmiths dehorning. Now, all through apocalyptic prophecy, a horn is a symbol of the strength of uh, an army. A horn is an aggressive weapon. And uh, therefore, he now sees a picture of dehorning going on in the four corners of the earth, that God is dehorning the aggressors. He's taken away the horn of Babylon already. Babylon is no longer a threat. And it just says God is going to dehorn the nations that have threatened them for a time. So we've got a picture here of peace and the enemies dehorned. 
so they can get on with building the temple and put all their resources into that. Then we have a man with a measuring line and now the attention shifts to the city of Jerusalem and they see the man measuring out for the walls. And actually Zechariah realizes the city is going to be far too small. That eventually the city will outgrow the walls. Now Jeremiah had predicted this and it's fascinating. I've got a series of maps of Jerusalem all through the ages of where it was when it was first this little city of David and how it expanded and stretched. And Jeremiah has exactly predicted the extension of the city of Jerusalem today and the direction of it and where the suburbs would be. Now, of course, the problem with a rapidly expanding city is how do you defend it? Because as soon as you make walls, the inside the walls gets more and more crowded. You go to York and see the shambles and see how in the medieval cities they got more and more crowded because it was only safe to live inside the wall. But Jerusalem was going to be far too small. The man with the measuring line says, that's going to be too small for all the people who will come and live here. And then there's a lovely promise given. God says, I will be the wall. I will be the wall. You won't need a wall when the city expands. I will defend it. The next uh, little picture, by the way, there is a lovely phrase in that. It says, God says, whoever touches my people touches the apple of my eye. Now, again, there's a text that most preachers misunderstand. It doesn't mean a cox's orange pippin in the hand. The apple of the eye is the iris of the eye. You look in a mirror and you'll see that middle bit looks just like an apple on end with the stalk in the middle. You know the little, the iris with the lines on it? Well, you take an apple and look at the stalk end and you'll see the iris of an eye. That's what the apple of the eye means. It is the most sensitive part of your body. And as soon as even a speck of dust touches it, your eyelid slams down. And the eyelid in Scripture is called the keeper. That's the Hebrew word for eyelid. The keeper of the eye slams down to protect that very sensitive part of your body. In fact, um, my wife and I have much reason to think of this. Psalm 121 was given to her and me when she developed cancer in her eye. And uh, it was very serious, malignant melanoma running through and surgeon told us she'd have to remove half her face probably, which I couldn't cope with. I'd rather she were in heaven with a whole face than living down here with half one. But um, the Lord had mercy on us and here she is with no trace of it, whatever. But it was in the iris, the apple of her eye. And when I read Psalm 121, which I preached on when she was taken away to a hospital, it said, the Lord is my keeper, my eyelid. He slams down as soon as anything touches his people. It's a wonderful picture. And uh, that was the scripture that took us both through and she was given the promise by her nurse, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. And ten days later I drove her away from the hospital without a bandage on and we went and climbed the Canadian Rockies together. <laughs> she lifted up her eyes to the hills. But uh, the Lord is the keeper, he's the eyelid and his people are the iris of his eye. In other words, my people, says the Lord, are the most sensitive part of me. You touch them and you touch me. Jesus was to say, and as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you do it to me. It's the same principle. God's people are the most sensitive part of God. <laughs> the Living Bible puts it, um, something like this, it says, whoever touches my people sticks his finger in the Lord's eye. That's vividly put. Can you imagine it? It's a wonderful picture. And once again, the refrain keeps coming, then you will know. Now, what he's saying is this, the nations that have touched you, I'm going to deal with. And then he says another lovely thing about other nations. He said, but some of the other nations are going to join you. They're going to become part of you. Here are two predictions about Gentile nations. One, those that attack Israel have God to face. Two, many of those Gentiles will become part of Israel. Then you will know, it comes for both. When I touch those who've touched Israel, you will know. 
and when Gentiles join you, then you will know. And both things have happened. History is proof that the God of Israel exists. It was the philosopher Heidegger who was asked by the Emperor Frederick of Prussia, give me one proof of the existence of God. And the philosopher Heidegger simply said, Your Majesty, the Jews, their history is proof. Then you will know. Whoever has dared to attack Israel pays for it sooner or later. And yet other nations like us have joined Israel and been grafted into their fruit tree. So we know this morning that God sent Zechariah. <laughs> We've got proof. We're here. We're in the olive tree. And that prophecy came true. Let's move on quickly. Joshua's change of clothes. He's now looking at the leadership they've got. The prince, Zerubbabel, and the priest, Joshua. What's going to happen now? Well, the first thing is that Satan comes into the picture. Do you know, the devil hardly ever appears in the Old Testament. Have you ever noticed that? I can only think of Genesis 3, in the Garden of Eden, and uh, what else? At the end of Chronicles, when he tempted David to number Israel, and Job, he appears, and here. And I think that's about all. If you can think of another, let me know. But uh, you can count on one hand the number of times the devil takes any part in Old Testament history. Now, of course, he's behind an awful lot of things. But he becomes far more prominent when Jesus arrived. Because frankly, the devil was quite happy to be incognito in the Old Testament. He was ruling the world. He'd got the whole human race in his hand. And... Uh, his cleverest trick is to play dead so that people don't think he's around. He just carries on controlling everything. But he does appear here. It's as if when he saw the Jews coming back and he knew that from them and in that country would come the saviour of the world, he just had to try and do something. Whenever something really significant is going to happen, the devil tries to stop it happening. And that is why he tried to kill every male Jew in Egypt so that Moses would never be born and the people would never get out of Egypt. And that is why he killed all the babies at Bethlehem when Jesus was born because he didn't want that baby to grow up and do another Moses for his people. See, once you know the devil's devices, you can spot him. But here he is and he says, you can't have Joshua to lead you. He's a dirty man. And, so, and Zechariah saw Joshua standing in filthy clothes and realized the devil was right. Now, the devil does seem to have the function of the counsel for the prosecution in heaven. I mean, in Job, he's there in heaven, in the counsel of God, criticizing people on earth, accusing them. He is the slanderer. He is the accuser. And here he says, you can't have Joshua. His past is sinful. He was one of those who was sinning that led to the exile, which means he was probably quite elderly. He said, you can't have him. And then in the vision, Zechariah hears that Joshua is like a brand plucked from the burning, like a half-burnt stick pulled out of the fire. Words which years later were used of John Wesley as a little boy of ten when the rectory in Epworth in Lincolnshire caught fire and he was trapped in an attic and men stood on each other's shoulders and rescued the boy, John Wesley, from the fire. What would have happened had he died? See, England would have gone the same way as the French Revolution probably. And Wesley lived by these words of Zechariah for the rest of his life. He said, I'm a brand plucked from the burning. I've been rescued from the Holocaust. And that's how Joshua was seen by God. He's a brand plucked from the burning. He's a stick pulled out of the fire. I've saved him. And then in the vision, the angels come and they take the dirty clothes off and they clothe him in clean clothes, put a clean turban on his head, and the man is clean in God's sight and can be a priest. It's a beautiful picture. And he saw that by God's grace, Joshua, in spite of having shared in the sins of his people earlier, was now clean in God's sight and could be the priest. 
And God makes a promise that what he'd done for this one Jew, he will one do, day do for the whole nation. He said, I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. God can clean a person up, make him a priest. And there's another little promise there. In that day, each of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and his fig tree. Words which recall Jesus finding Nathaniel. I saw you under your fig tree. Well, there are so many meanings here, hidden meanings that are picked up in the New Testament and that show you how rich were these pictures that God was giving Zechariah. Let's look at the next. He now sees a gold lampstand. You know the seven-branch golden lampstand in the temple? He sees that, but he sees a vessel higher than the lamp with a tube running down into the lamp. And he realizes the vessel is full of oil and that nobody will never ever need to replenish the oil in the lamps because there's a reservoir of oil just flowing through the lampstand. What's all this about? This is about Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel is seen as someone who has a reservoir of the Holy Spirit pouring through him. The oil, of course, is always a symbol of God's Holy Spirit. That's why the word anointing is used when the Holy Spirit comes on someone. Anointing with oil. Our queen was anointed with oil when she was crowned. It's called the chrism, that little bit of the ceremony, because chrism or Christ means anointing. Same word. And so Zerubbabel is God's anointed. And the word for anointed in Hebrew is Mashiach or Messiah as we call it, but it's really Mashiach, God's anointed one. It's a royal sign. But then comes a text that again has been quoted by so many, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Boy, that becomes a motto for so many things. What does it mean? Not by might means not by military might. Not by power means not by political power. In other words, the royal line of David must achieve what it achieves, not by having an army, not by gaining political authority, but by the Spirit. And when Jesus came from that royal line, he did not have an army. He said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, else would my servants fight. What a tragedy that the church ever got that wrong and the crusades happened. You cannot establish the kingdom of God by military or political power. You can only do it by my spirit. But the proof that this uh, power was given to Zerubbabel is a most unusual thing which you may have missed as you read it. It's this. When they got the temple to the top, the topping out ceremony it's called today and builders used to put a little flag up when they got to the top, there is the, the capstone, the last stone to go on a gable that joins the two sides as they've been built up. The last stone to go in is the capstone and it says that Zerubbabel would actually lift that capstone into place with his hands. It's a, usually quite a heavy stone and he would actually carry it and this would be proof to the people. There's the refrain again. When he lifts that stone and climbs up the scaffolding and up the ladders carrying the stone and puts it in place, single-handed, with no aid, no ropes, no pulleys, just carrying it up and puts it in place, then you will know that I, the Almighty Lord, have sent my prophet to you. Can you get the scene? <laughs> Everybody said, he'll never lift that. Not by might nor by power, but by might. That's how Samson carried the gates of the Philistine city away. And now the same Holy Spirit is giving Zerubbabel the power to lift that big stone and get it up. It's like lifting one of your lorries to get the wheel changed. And he lifts the stone and he pops it, the last stone of the temple. Which meant that uh, that generation would live to see the temple complete. Exciting little picture, isn't it? And sometimes we sort of miss these little touches. But he said, 
how do you know that the kingdom will be built not by political or military might, but by the Spirit? Well, when you, says the rubber bell, pop the stone in place, then you will know. I'm getting all excited about this, but... See, I'm supposed to be a teacher, but I find myself preaching. <laughs> the next thing, he sees um, two olive trees, and of course these stand for Zerubbabel and Joshua. There is to be a dual kind of leadership. And in fact, sorry, I've jumped, haven't I? Um, no? Uh, the lampstand really says the Spirit will go to both of them because there are two olive trees. And the oil comes from olive trees. And so you've got two anointed leaders here. And they're going to need both. So rubber bell is necessary to the future, though not as a king. You see, they can't have a king. I have the feeling it's because they couldn't have a king in Persia that uh, they thought, well, if we crown the priest, they can't object. We'll call him priest when he's really our king. I think maybe it was a device to avoid trouble with the Persian Empire. Nevertheless, this is what happened. The temple will be completed in their lifetime, and then they will know. Who has despised the day of small things, said Haggai, but now it's going to be completed, and the temple will be there. And the last one, no, second last, is the flying scroll. And here on the scroll, which is 10 by 5 meters, it's a great big scroll, 10 meters by 5 meters, it's flying through the air over the land. And on it is written curses on all who steal and lie. And it's going over the homes of all the people. And whenever it comes over the house of someone who's stealing or lying, a curse drops from the scroll on the house. And the house is destroyed. And this is the next picture, he said. Now we're turning to the people. And he's, what Zechariah is saying very simply is, uh, some of you are stealing and lying. And he says, I see this scroll floating over your houses and it's going to drop a curse on whichever house has stolen property in it or been telling lies. Boy, that must have shaken the people up a bit and got them cleaned up. Because still there's this moral concern underneath it all. And where there was no repentance, he did say, if the scroll stops over your house, repent and the curse won't come. But uh, if you don't repent, the curse will drop. And finally he sees... No, not finally. He sees a woman in a measuring basket, a 35-litre basket. That's quite big. And there's a woman in it. She's a horrible woman. Looks a bit like a prostitute, actually. And two more women with stork's wings come flying down, and they pick up the basket in their beaks, <laughs> or however, maybe with their arms, and they picked up the basket with the other woman in it, and they flew away to the east. What's all this? It's a picture of God taking sins away taking their sins away to Babylon. That's the direction. Saying, I took you sinners away there. Now I want to take your sin away there because that's where it belongs. Babylon is the place of sin. And it's a picture of the sins being removed, taken away. Finally, the picture of four chariots, red, black, white, and dappled gray horses. And... Uh, they go out throughout the whole earth, and now these horses with chariots are going out all over the world to do God's will. They've already finished their work in the north in Babylon, so that chariot is having a rest, a holiday. But the other three go out, and they go everywhere in the world, God's agents to do His will. God has a worldwide control of history. His agents can be sent anywhere speedily. That's the, mean, the method... Uh, message of the chariot. They can go anywhere he sends them to do his will. That completes the pictures for that night. I'll just go on to the fourth. I think I have just two minutes, have I? Yes. Uh, it's at that point that three wise men arrive from Babylon. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> that happened again centuries later. But three of the wise men who were merchants, traders, came from Babylon and they brought a load of silver and gold as a gift for the temple. But Zechariah was told to take some of it and make a crown and then have a coronation in the temple of Joshua. 
then you will know that I am the Lord. There's the refrain again. But this is a crucial point. First time, as I said earlier, that priest and king were ever united in Israel. They had been united in Jerusalem long before the Jews took it, in the days of Melchizedek, but now the order of Melchizedek is being re-established. The prince is the king, is the priest, and the two are combined. But there is an if in all this. You should always notice the word if, and the word if is, if my people diligently obey. If. God is saying, I'm giving you a king again, but not from the royal line of David this time. I'm giving you a king so that you are a kingdom, but it's the priest so that Persia won't be upset about you having a king. You can always say, well, he's just our priest. We, we crown our priests. It's a neat device to encourage them to be the kingdom of Israel again, and yet it's not the true fulfillment of the promises of the Messiah yet. Well, now we stopped studying Zechariah uh, in the first half, and we need to go back to that just to pick up the final prophecy that he gave to the present problems of Israel, the same problems that Haggai had faced, Zechariah now faced. But this was an interesting question which was brought to him uh, some two years after he gave these encouraging pictures and crowned the priest Joshua as king. Two years later, a group of people came from up north, came from a place called Bethel. Now this is very significant. It means that within two years they'd begun to spread out over the old country and were re-establishing other towns than Jerusalem. So Bethel was now at least a small hamlet again. And the people came down from Bethel seeking guidance about their religious life. And they came to a priest, but they found a prophet. And the question concerned two practices, fasting and feasting. Because these were the two practices as part of their religion. There were times when they went without food and times when they really had a good, a good meal together. Fasting and feasting, both have a place. Jesus did both. But uh, they came and they said, we want to ask first of all about the fasts were regularly observing, and of course they had two a year, in the fifth month and the seventh. And these were fasts to remember how Jerusalem had been destroyed, to mourn for the loss of the city. And the question was very simple, these two fasts in the fifth and the seventh month, how much longer are we supposed to go on doing this? Because I mean we've got Jerusalem back again, so why go on mourning? It's the kind of question that gets asked every November in this country, how much longer do we mourn the dead of two world wars? Especially since most of the immediate relatives are now dead themselves. How much longer do we go on mourning over disasters in the past? And it's a relevant question so you can understand it. So they said, how much longer do we go on fasting? And Zechariah's answer was quite interesting. He said, well, actually, he said, fasting is really a rather self-centered thing. It's because you pity yourselves because you're sorry for yourself. You're sorry you didn't leave your sins alone. You're not really mourning for your sins, you're mourning for yourselves because of the penalty your sins brought you. He said, the kind of fast that God would like now, and here he quotes Isaiah. Zechariah obviously studied the other prophets, he frequently quotes them, but it goes back to Isaiah 58, what we call 58, where Isaiah said, this is the kind of fast you should have, and that's to fast from dishonesty and to fast from cruelty and to be generous and kind and help the helpless and succor the needy. That's the kind of fast that God really wants, not doing without food, but doing without uh, insensitivity to need. And uh, Perhaps that's got a relevant word for those who practice Lent still. Not so much doing without something as, as doing without sin and therefore being free to serve other people. Free of self, that's what you should fast from yourselves and give yourselves to others. It's an interesting answer because he said it's precisely for 
these reasons that the exile came. It was because you became so selfish and so greedy instead of so generous and so kind. And so if you really want to s remember all that properly, he said, do it by not doing the things they did, not just going through a token fast from food. And then the next question they had was, what about the feasts? There had been certain festivals which had been kept up in the exile, but there were more holidays than holy days actually. Uh, there were celebrations. And once again, they, they actually had them in the 4th, 5th, 7th and 10th months. So they had two fasts a year in exile and four feasts a year in exile and they're really saying, now we've got back home, what do we do about the fasts and what do we do about the feasts that had started during that exile? And uh, again he says, your feasts are really far too self-centered. You're just having a good, good time, food, friendship and fun. He said, how about making them a celebration of God? Make them holy days instead of holidays. And really be thankful that God has brought you back to the land and praise him. Don't just have a holiday or a bank holiday, but have a celebration of the fact that God has been faithful to you, that you're back in the holy mountain, that the streets are full of young people and elderly people again. And rejoice that God is going to bring more back and repopulate the whole land. That's what you should be doing with your feasts. So, he says, really, change from weeping to laughter, change from sorrow to joy. It's time to celebrate, but celebrate with God at the center. So he gives them guidance. And it's then that he says, you need to be ready for the fact that many more people are going to come to you Jews because you know God. He's giving them a missionary outlook. He's saying there'll come a time when people will come and seize the skirt of one Jew and say, tell us about your God. You should be ready for that. I remember once I was sitting in uh, Jerusalem with an elderly Jewish man and I was trying to talk to him about his God and his Messiah. And I was saying, you know, you've got it all. We had to get it all from you. We wouldn't know God but for you Jews. Our Bible is a Jewish book, our Saviour is a Jew. We owe it all to you. And I didn't realise, but as I talked to him, I'd got hold of his trousers. <laughs> and I'd got hold of his trousers, and I was pulling them as I said, and I said, you know, you've got everything. And I suddenly remembered Zechariah's word about many Gentiles will come and seize the clothes of a Jew and say, we got it from you. <laughs> Share it with us. And uh, that's it. Well now that's the end of the first half which is relatively straightforward, may I warn you. <laughs> the second half does get complicated because now he's turning away from the present situation, he's looking into the distant future. And what he says in bits and pieces now could fit any time centuries ahead. And it's not in any particular order, it's like a jigsaw box, when you first open a box of a jigsaw puzzle, there are all little bits and pieces and some are red and some are green, some are blue and you don't know where they fit. And without a picture on the lid, you're really lost. Now I must admit, I love jigsaws but I always cheat. I prop up the box lid and I take a piece of red and I go... Now that is cheating, a proper jigsaw puzzle, you don't do that, you do it without the picture. And that's what we've got to do with Zechariah, we don't have the picture. Actually we do, the picture's in Revelation. It's interesting, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 in the New Testament says that God spoke to our fathers in the olden times through the prophets in bits and pieces, but now he has spoken to us through his Son. Meaning, we've now got the picture on the lid. We can now begin to fit all these pieces together and know how it's all going to turn out. And that is why the book of Revelation quotes Zechariah again and again and again. And the book of Revelation begins to fit these pictures, these pieces into the picture of the distant future or what we've come to call the end times, a time when history reaches its countdown. And it is Jesus who will break the seals on the scroll of the countdown of history. And so we're in a great advantage to the Jews who read this book. 
who only see the bits and pieces and don't know how they fit together. Even so, it's not easy. There's a distinct change in style and content. There is now some poetry. It's all been prose so far, but there's a bit of poetry now. No mention of the contemporary situation now. There's no mention here of the temple or Joshua or Zerubbabel. No visions. Even God's name changes. Throughout the first half of the book, God has been the Lord of hosts or Yahweh of heaven's armies. But now he's just Yahweh. That's a distinct change. Uh, it's quite a different sort of feel. It's so different that some scholars say it must have been someone else who wrote this. But why couldn't Zechariah change? Some scholars are very rigid in their ideas. They love taking a pair of scissors to the Bible. In fact, just as Manasseh cut the poor prophet Isaiah in half, the scholars keep cutting his book in half. They say it's by two different Isaiahs, or even three. And they take Zechariah and they cut that in half and say, Zechariah wrote the first bit, the second bit's so different. But in fact, the second bit is different because God gave it to him in a different way. And these are not dated, so we don't know when he gave it to them, maybe been years later. Well now, the content, as I've said, is looking into the future, and now they are called oracles. I don't wonder if you notice that in your Bible, an oracle. The word actually is heavy, weighty, but it's usually translated oracle into English. I don't think that really conveys it. It's a heavy burden. There's something heavy coming now. And uh, if you've been given a heavy burden by the Lord, you know what I'm talking about. When something is just heavy on your heart until you share it, and once you've shared it, it lightens. You know when the burden is delivered, but it, it's heavy and it weighs on your mind and heart until you've done something with it. Well, these came as two great burdens, two heavy messages, just the two. One of them is covered by chapters 9 to 11 and the other by 12 to 14, and they are very different. So let's uh, begin to look at them and see what we can get out of them. I think the only way really is to study each separate piece, see what it says, and then as God enables us through reading Revelation and the New Testament, we'll gradually be begin to fit the pieces into the overall picture of the end times. In chapters 9 to 11, the focus is on the people of Israel. It is very much a national future picture that he's seeing, the picture of national restoration. And uh, if anything, this picture precedes the later one. So it's sooner rather than later, and what comes in the next section is later rather than sooner. But we can't date them. There are no dates, no indication as to when these things happen, or even if they're in the right order, they may not be. So all we can do is look at each piece of the picture. So we're looking here at the future of Israel and national restoration. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six pictures that are, or, that are part of this future. You can't relate them to each other. The first is that their enemies will be vanquished. That all those who've come against Jerusalem will be dealt with by God. He will not allow Jerusalem ever to be wiped off the map. It's his city. It's where he put his name. Therefore, I can guarantee that even if uh, New York and Beijing and Washington, D.C. and New Delhi and all of those cities are wiped off the map, Jerusalem will still be there. God will vanquish their enemies and there will always be Jewish survivors to be integrated into the land. He even says some Philistines will join you. And since modern-day Palestinians call themselves descendants of the Philistines, it's an intriguing promise. And there will come a day when never again will an oppressor run over my people. Now that day hasn't come yet, but there will come a day when never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for I am keeping watch. Now it's just a piece of the picture, and we don't know what date that will be fulfilled, but it's a promise of God, and God keeps his promises even if he waits centuries to do so. The second picture is a picture of a king of peace. 
riding to Jerusalem on a donkey. And here again is a piece of the picture. We know when this fits the picture because Jesus did exactly that. The tragedy is, of course, that when Jesus fulfilled this prophecy, they didn't notice the donkey. And they thought he was riding on a donkey because he couldn't get a horse. And they never got the message. Because when Jesus rode in on a donkey and they waved their palms and threw their coats down, they were shouting, Hoshana, Hoshana. And we think that's a kind of heavenly hello, you know, Hosanna. It's nothing of the kind. It means, liberate us now, set us free now. It's, it's a cry of people who've been oppressed for centuries, who see political autonomy coming near, who see freedom coming. It's the cry of freedom fighters. Hoshana! And they call him Son of David. Hoshana, Son of David, set us free! But he wasn't coming to fight for them. Had he wanted to come and fight for their liberation, he'd have ridden a horse as he will do at his second coming. When Israel sees him the next time, he will be on a horse, not a donkey. But he came first as the Prince of Peace on a donkey. And they got the biggest shock in their lives when he went through the gate in Jerusalem and turned left instead of right. And he grabbed a whip. And when they saw him do that, they thought he's going to whip the Romans out of town. But he turned left into the temple instead of right into the fortress Antonio where the Roman soldiers were based. And the crowd fell silent. And then he whipped Jews out of God's temple. I am not surprised that a few days later they said, you can crucify that man. We'll have this freedom fighter here. And the irony of history is that that other freedom fighter they chose had a most unusual name. His name was Jesus Bar Abbas, which means Jesus, Son of the Father. And on that day, there were two men, both called Jesus, Son of the Father. And Pilate said, which Jesus, Son of the Father, do you want? The man who won't fight for you or the man who will? And they said, we'll have the fighter. Do you understand now what was happening? It was the sheer disappointment when he rode in on a donkey and attacked not Romans but Jews. That really, if you disappoint a crowd, they will quickly turn right against you. If you don't give a crowd what, you want, what they want and fulfill the hopes they've built up in you, you are heading for trouble. And that's why Jesus was crucified a few days later after he'd been welcomed with palms and Hoshana! He's coming to fight for our liberation at last. Well, he will come on a horse and liberate Israel. <coughs> Not yet. So here's this little piece of the jigsaw. And it says that he will bring righteousness and peace, shalom, harmony, and he will have dominion from sea to sea. There's an interesting sidelight on that. Another text that's been taken out of context and misused. You're from Canada. And Canada is called the Dominion of Canada. And do you know why? Because of this text in Zechariah. Because it stretches from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And so it's called the Dominion from sea to sea. It's the only country in the world that's called the Dominion of Canada. And it's because of this. But I'm quite sure Zechariah was not thinking of Canada. <laughs> He was thinking of Jesus coming and reigning from sea to sea. <laughs> now, the next picture is of the mighty God. Here we have it. Here we have a picture of the Lord fighting for them, of appearing visibly. It's a contradiction to coming in peace now. We have here a Lord who will come for his flock and be a good shepherd to them, unlike the bad shepherds they've had. And it says, his people will sparkle like jewels in his crown. There's a lovely phrase there. Now comes a bit of a shock. This one talks about Greece. And it was going to be centuries before the Greeks came and conquered this land. And that dreadful man, Antiochus Epiphanes, 
who went into the temple, raised the statue of Zeus, slaughtered a pig on the altar, and filled the vestries with prostitutes. It was their worst time of all, and it lasted exactly three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days, which is exactly the period predicted of Antichrist in the New Testament. Under Antiochus Epiphanes, the Jews suffered what the world will suffer, what Christians will suffer under Antichrist. Intriguing. That Greece should be predicted in that third little piece of the picture. Now we can fit it in. But what they made of it at the time, I do not know. The next picture is of gathered people of the diaspora reversed, of the dispersion brought home. And Jews brought from every land back to this land. Do you know that present-day Israel, people have come from 70 nations? Jews have come from 70 nations back to Israel today. And they brought the music of 70 nations and the dances of 70 nations. The culture of Israel is unique today. It's a combination. The Yemen Jews brought some of their best dances. And the culture of Israel, the treasures of the nations have been brought even to this Jerusalem. And uh, when we go there, we'll take you to a symphony concerts and you'll hear the best music in the world. And this is a picture of the gathered people coming home. And there will not be enough room for them, Zechariah says. All those who come home. It's a little piece that we can now fit in, but it was just a little glimpse of the future then. And it even says that a highway will be built between Egypt and Assyria. Well, uh, Isaiah had said this, but here we have Egypt and Assyria, which today would be Egypt and Iraq, brought into the picture somehow. Where that piece is going to fit in is your guess, good as mine, except that Egypt has helped to bring peace. Well, the next picture is a puzzling one. It's of all their neighbours being deforested, all the trees being cut down in the Middle East. The cedars of Lebanon, the oaks of Transjordan or Bashan, and even the jungle of Jordan. Well, the jungle of Jordan is largely gone. And the cedars of Lebanon, there's only one little patch of them left, about a dozen or so trees on one hill. And the oaks of Bashan have gone. Now, I'm not sure why this picture was shown. It's a little piece of the puzzle. That's what it is. The next picture is of worthless shepherds. It's a very strange thing. But here we have an acted parable. Zechariah takes a job as a foreman shepherd and has to sack three shepherds for not looking after the sheep. And they throw their wages back at him, 30 pieces of silver. And the little verse comes, when the shepherd is smitten, the sheep are scattered. Now once again, we've got little bits of picture, and yet you begin to see where they fit in when you read the Gospels, don't you? When Judas throws his 30 pieces of silver back into the temple because he was a bad shepherd. He'd been a preacher and a healer. When Jesus said, the shepherd has been smitten and the sheep are scattered. He knew all these stories, all these pictures, and he was using them. Well, those are the first ones. They're all concerned with Israel. And the little pieces, little glimpses, just a word here, a sentence there, and a picture there. And somehow, looking back, we begin to see how it was all glimpses of the future. But now the the whole scene broadens out. It's now international. We're looking at the world now. We're looking at things that are going to happen on an international basis. And yet, Jerusalem is now at the heart of it all. Twenty-one times we find the name Jerusalem in this section. You don't find it here. Isn't that interesting? It's as if Jerusalem is seen now as the focus of the international future, as indeed it will be. That's where the United Nations headquarters will have to be moved to. Here's a picture of Zion as the center of world government. And we're looking way into the future. 
Let's just look at some of the words that are frequently mentioned in this last half. Jerusalem is mentioned 21 times. Therefore, it's going to be a very, very significant city in the end times. The second word that I want you to notice, a total of 18 times, is the word day. It hasn't appeared anywhere here, but now it's all the way through. The day, the day of the Lord, on that day, the day known to the Lord, the day, the day, the day. And that word occurs frequently in the New Testament. Jesus used it an awful lot, on that day. Now this day is not a 24-hour day. The, the Hebrew word yom, or day, can mean anything from a 24-hour period to a whole era. For example, well, we use it the same way in English, the word day. If I say, the day of the horse and, tract, uh, uh, horse and cart has gone, and the day of the tractor has come, I'm not talking about 24-hour days at all. You understand what I mean? Every dog has its day, <laughs> but a dog with a sore tail has a weekend. <laughs> but I'm, I'm using the word day there, you see, in quite a different way. I'm losing it quite, using it quite loosely. A day meaning an era. And really the day of the Lord means man has had his day. Now the Lord is having his day. Do you see? It's a whole era. It's not 24 hours. It's the day of the Lord. It's his day now. We've had our day, but now he has his day. Exciting phrase. There will come the day of the Lord, and the world will see it's his day now. And the day of man's pride and greed is over. And the day of God's holiness is here. Only one part is poetry. And... The word day doesn't come in that little bit of poem, interestingly enough. Now let's look at the different pieces. Again, they're pieces of a jigsaw. The first is a picture of an international United Nations force attacking Jerusalem. An army gathered from the entire nations of the world that is sent to the Middle East. Now that hasn't happened yet but it's a piece of the jigsaw. Jerusalem has yet to be attacked in that way. So the troubles of Israel are not over, not by a long way, believe me. But we, sh we may live to see this United Nations force sent to attack the Jews. They have very few friends left at the United Nations, very few. And America, her major friend, is now beginning to turn against Israel. The United Nations are willing to send an international force anywhere to do what they feel is necessary. I can see it happening, but I don't think we can fit this into the picture yet. The next picture is of grieving inhabitants. I think I do need to read um, verse 10 to you. Let me just uh, quickly look it up. This is chapter 12, verse 10. When all this trouble comes and they grieve, it says, then I will pour out the spirit of grace and prayer on all the people of Jerusalem. And they will look on him whom they pierced and mourn for him as for an only son and grieve for, bitterly for him as for an oldest child who died. The sorrow and mourning in Jerusalem at that time will be even greater than the grievous mourning for the godly king Josiah, who was killed in the valley of Megiddo. All of Israel will weep in profound sorrow. That hasn't come yet. But there'll come a day when the people of Jerusalem are so desperate, at last they will not try and make peace treaties with Palestinians or anyone else. They'll cry to God. And the answer, they'll see him whom they pierced. Can you imagine how the Jews will feel when they realize that Jesus was their Messiah and they killed him? They will weep as if their oldest son had been murdered. It's amazing, isn't it? Multiply the grief of Dunblane by the grief of Jerusalem in that day. Now it's Zechariah who says they will actually see him whom they pierced. 
And in fact, that very phrase is taken up in the first chapter of the book of Revelation, where it says, when Jesus comes back, they will, those who pierced him will see him. And the only thing needed to convert a Jew is, the, is to know that Jesus of Nazareth is alive. That was all it took for Saul of Tarsus. And I found it's all that it takes today. I was preaching in, in Cambridgeshire and there was a Jewess of about 25 years of age, very smart girl, in the congregation. And afterwards she said, could I talk to you? We went into the vestry of this little Methodist church and she said, are you trying to tell me that Jesus of Nazareth is still alive? I said, yes. She said, then he must be our Messiah. Our Messiah. I felt quite out of it. <laughs> and... She said, how could I find out if he's alive? I said, you could try talking to him. And I left her talking to him and she found out. And within 10 minutes, she was teaching me the Bible. She showed me from the Old Testament, then this and this and this, and she saw it all in a flash. She'd got it all there, except for the one vital clue that Jesus was the name. And when she found out Jesus was alive, that was it. And when the whole nation sees him whom they pierced, I have no difficulty believing they'll all be converted, but they'll weep their way to faith. Looking back on 2,000 wasted years, when they could have been leading the world, and they've been hounded from one country to another, as the book of Deuteronomy said they would be. No wonder they'll weep. Can't you see it? And it's all there in Zechariah the grieving inhabitants of Jerusalem. Next, the banished prophets. He vividly sees that false prophets have been one of the greatest dangers Jerusalem ever had and that Jerusalem is going to be cleansed of all such people. It says they will be cleansed of sin and washed from all impurity by a fountain of water. And this is taken up by Paul in Romans 11, when Paul says, then all Israel shall be saved, he goes on to talk about Zion being cleansed from sin. And the false prophets then will be so ashamed and so disgraced, they will disown their profession. They will say, I'm not a prophet. I got these wounds in a friendly brawl. <laughs> it's, it's so amusing because prophets will be wounded. I'm not a prophet. I just was in a fight. <laughs> uh, it's a vivid story of people ashamed of having given false teaching. The next picture is of a reduced population. Now this passage is a bit of a mix, misfit. It's not in order quite clearly but it's of a Jerusalem that has been reduced to between half and one-third of its population. It's, it's a throwback to that uh, shepherd smitten and sheep scattered one. I frankly have to say I'm not quite sure where this fits, if it's future or past to us, where two-thirds of the population will be wiped out. I don't know. It's one of those I have a wait-and-see attitude towards. But in chapter 14, we are back to this international attack on Jerusalem. And I believe that is future to us. And uh, we still have to see this city attacked by a United Nations force. God will gather this huge military force and yet he will also fight for them. It is clearly linked closely to the second coming and probably to the Battle of Armageddon because here we have the statement, and his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. Now God can't do that, he hasn't got feet, but Jesus could. And uh, this is interpreted by all Jews as the coming of the Messiah, and his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. I have some close links with artists in uh, Israel. They seem to be the most prophetic people, and the ones with the clearest vision of the future. And one art artist, uh, Motka, I have a very close association with him, and he sent me one of his pictures, a print of one of his latest pictures. It's, it's looking at the Mount of Olives. It's a kind of purple picture, and the temple area is in the foreground. And then up in the sky, there's a kind of yellow glow just 
coming into the picture. There's, the, there must be a very bright light just above the picture and you can see the glow in the dark sky coming through. And uh, he didn't need to explain it to me, but he said, uh, that's the glory of the Messiah appearing over the Mount of Olives. <laughs> I wish I'd brought it to show you, but uh, uh, I should have thought of it. Well, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And it says then there will be a great eruption which will cause amazing geophysical changes to the whole area. In particular, one of the changes, I assume we have to take it literally, though it boggles the imagination, whereas Jerusalem is down in a hollow surrounded by mountains. In fact, you know the Dome of the Rock, it's uh, an octagon with eight sides. Each side looks directly to a peak. There are eight peaks around Jerusalem. It's an amazing geometrical landscape. Uh, the east face of the Dome of the Rock faces the Mount of Olives. The northeast faces Mount Scopus, and so you can go around. South faces the Mount of uh, Condemnation, or what is the... Anyway, if ever you go, stand with your back to each of those eight walls, and you're looking at a peak. But it says in that day, when his feet stand on the Mount of Olives, the peaks will shake and go down, and Jerusalem will be left on the peak. That's when everybody will go up to the Mount of the Lord. It's an astonishing picture. Jerusalem will at last be the high place, and the place you can see from miles away, which you can't. You can't see Jerusalem at all until you come up over the lip of the rim of hills around Jerusalem. You can't see it from a distance down in the hollow, but then it'll be lifted up because the hills will drop and there will be a way of escape to the east, a great open valley, the Mount of Olives opening up into a wide valley. Well, it's all part of the picture. Our imagination finds it quite difficult to fit it all in, but the main point of this picture is that that United Nations force around the city will be dealt with. Those who've come to attack Jerusalem, the final battle, will be held. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths and in panic they will kill each other. Well, we're dealing with supernatural events, but after all this picture, guess what it says? Then you will know. Then you will know. It's certainly apocalyptic. And finally, there's a picture of, after that, all the nations seeing Jerusalem as the place of God's name. Furthermore, there's a picture of all the nations of the world observing one of the Jewish feasts, the Feast of Tabernacles. Not Pentecost, not Passover, but a picture of all the nations of the world coming, sending representatives to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Isn't that fascinating? See, it's the one feast Christians ignore. Tragically, we observe Passover, in a sense, with Easter. We observe Pentecost with Whit Sunday, But Tabernacles? For the Jew, that's the greatest feast. The biggest, the best. It's a celebration. It's their harvest festival. It's the finest harvest home, the final harvest home. <laughs> And the Jews celebrate it. They live in little booths open to the sky so they can see the stars. And they remember how God brought them through the wilderness, but they celebrate it. It's an eight-day feast, and the final day is a wedding day. Funnily enough, they get married to the law. And there's a wedding canopy and a rabbi with a scroll of the law of Moses stands under the canopy and they all dance around and they get married to the law of Moses for another year and they start reading Genesis 1-1 the next morning. And they read through until they read the last verse in Deuteronomy 12 months later. Then they get married to the law again. But they've got the wrong bridegroom because that eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles looks forward to the marriage supper of the Messiah the marriage supper of the Lamb. My wife and I had a great privilege. Our silver wedding was on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the marriage of the Messiah. And we were in Israel, and we celebrated it with 1,200 other people down in the wilderness of Judea at night, and we had a feast, and there was a huge bonfire and a pillar of fire by night, and we ate roast quails. 
and I went to a little shop in a back street in Jerusalem that morning and asked a little Jew to make me a ring that she wanted to give me. And you can come and see the ring. It's the wall of Jerusalem on the ring. And on the top, David, DVD, backwards, David. She gave it to me to remind me to be a watchman on the wall. And that was the 25th, the marriage day. See, it's got to be a marriage for you. You're all going to be married. I was talking in a school to some children and I said, a little boy asked me a question, why wasn't Jesus married? I said, it's all right, he's going to be. <laughs> and afterwards the headmaster in his office said, what were you teaching my children? <laughs> he said, what's this about Jesus getting married? I said, don't you know your Bible? I said, the whole Bible is a romance. It's how a father found a bride for his son. And it finishes up and they get married and live happily ever after. All good romances finish with a marriage and there it is. See? So this is the eighth day of this feast. And this is referred to in Revelation as the marriage supper of the Lamb. Did you know that Jesus was born during the Feast of Tabernacles? The clues are all there in Luke's Gospel. He was born in September or early October in the seventh month, which is the month of the Feast of Tabernacles. And it says the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And in John 7, his brother said, aren't you going to the Feast of Tabernacles? That's when they're expecting the Messiah. And they didn't believe him and they were teasing him. And he said, my time has not yet come. Therefore, of one thing I feel quite sure, and that is I know the month when Jesus will come back. I don't know the year but he must come back on time. It'll be in the Feast of Tabernacles. It says from, actually every Jew on the basis of Zechariah 14 believes that the Messiah will come during the Feast of Tabernacles. They have no doubt about it. And all this seems to have missed Christians thinking, but uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, one day we'll all go to Jerusalem. Your first free flight to the Holy Land. <laughs> because we're all gathering for it. And from then on, nations will celebrate that feast annually and send representatives to Jerusalem. And it says if they don't, they will get no rain. That of course doesn't affect Egypt because they don't get any rain anyway. They get their water from the Nile. So it says that for Egypt, if they don't come, they'll have a plague. But other nations won't get rain. But the Feast of Tabernacles has become for Jew and now for an increasing number of Christians a focal point of the hope for a universal reign of the Messiah over the whole world. And uh, the last time I went to the Christian Feast of Tabernacles, to which many hundreds go each year in Jerusalem, I walked down the street and I went to the vast paved area opposite the western wall and there was a huge marquee. And I went inside and Jewish families were seated at tables eating and they were happy and above them was a huge banner and on the banner were all the different nationalities coming up different roads and Jerusalem was isolated on a high mountain and they were all coming up. And then I walked back up the road to where the Christians have their Feast of Tabernacles and I saw a huge banner and here was Jerusalem on the top of a high mountain and all the nations of the world in different costumes and colours coming up the roads. I thought, ditto. <laughs> Deja vu, I've seen this before. And gradually through the Feast of Tabernacles, Jews and Christians are coming to a closer understanding of the hopes of the future. They're all based on Zechariah 14. Well, these are all little bits and pieces of the future. And now we are in a position to begin to fit them into the whole picture. I can't fit them all in yet because I don't think they've all happened yet. But as these things happen, you see before your very eyes, God's purposes being fulfilled. As we heard in the reading this morning, God has a purpose for the whole world and it's going to happen. Jesus is coming back to reign and we shall reign with him. Lord, they asked him when Jesus went back to his father, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? He says, not for you to know the times and the dates that Father has fixed. Which means Father has fixed the date. But he says, you get on and be my witnesses to the ends of the world. Because I want as many people there as possible. <laughs> as he said in one parable about the Heavenly Father, my house shall be full. <laughs>